A real uh, revolutionary right now. <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Today is Tuesday, May 10th, 2022. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Barricades surrounding the Supreme Court keep protesters at bay and security is tightening around court justices and their families. But didn't they actually rule that free speech is protected? 
Yeah, we'll talk to Congresswoman uh, Yellen Presley from Massachusetts uh, about the potential overturning of Roe v. Wade as well as student debt cancellation. The family of a black Georgia man killed by police say officers failed to adhere to four policies that could have prevented Matthew Zadok Williams' death. We'll hear from his mother and her attorney. COVID vaccine boosters may be more critical than ever. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Alvia Gaffney will explain why, especially with the new variants now spreading across the country. In today's HBCU Connect segment, Fisk University's president will tell us about the innovative endowment gift that will allow the institution for the first time to become an institutional investor in venture capital. And in our marketplace segment, we'll meet two friends whose black owned eyewear brand is partnering with Nickelodeon to create a children's eyewear line. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah, yeah. It's on go, 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 y'all. Yeah, yeah. It's rolling, Martin. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Rolling with rolling now. Yeah, yeah. He's funky, he's fresh, he's real, the best you know. He's rolling, Martin. Ever since the leak draft of a Supreme Court uh, decision regarding Roe v. Wade leaked, there has been an explosion of discussion all across the country, liberals and conservatives, those who are pro-choice, those who are anti-abortion. We've also seen the reaction from the Supreme Court. They've erected barriers around the Supreme Court to keep folks out. But this is the same Supreme Court, though, that previously ruled about buffer zones against abortion clinics. Now we have... Uh, the United States Senate passing by unanimous uh, consent, uh, increasing the security protection for Supreme Court just justices and their families. But this is the same Supreme Court that ruled that it was protected free speech to protest outside of the homes of abortion providers. Hmm. Why is good for the goose and not good for the gander. Joining us right now is Congresswoman Yana Presley from Massachusetts. Uh, glad to have you back on the show. Don't you find that to be interesting, that the Supreme Court could make these decisions, uh, but then go, oh, but that doesn't apply to us. Applies to the rest of y'all, but doesn't apply to us. Look, peaceful protest and a healthy democracy is certainly fine. Uh, that should not come at the expense and the safety of uh, any person or their family. Um, but I would say that it is, or rather, and it is telling that they would want to move with urgency on that instead of moving with urgency on the Women's Health Protection Act and protecting abortion rights, which is health care. And this is very consistent. You know, with this Senate, we have seen an undermining of progress and a steadfast obstruction of justice. Um, you know, I'm of the uh, opinion and the experience um, that this Senate has had uh, their foot on the neck of black America uh, and their knee on my body. When you make that point about how fast they move, that was something that people have made, made a comment about yesterday. Boy, that was real quick. Unanimous consent, no objection at all. And look, I I'm all about keeping public officials safe. But the reality is... Uh, we have seen peaceful protests. Senator Chuck Schumer uh, commented today that he is protests outside of his home three to four days a week, and he said uh, he's gotten used to that. But then now you have Senator Susan Collins who called the cops because someone actually uh, put uh, in crayon on her so on the sidewalk near her home, protecting a woman's right to an abortion. I mean, my, my goodness, you're now is Susan Collins now turning into a Karen? You're calling the cops because someone wrote some comments in chalk on the sidewalk? Again, it's telling that this is what they would like to fast track instead of all of the other issues which they have um, not advanced 
that are consistent with the will of majority of American people, and also that we desperately need everything from restoring voting rights to climate justice, um, now to um, agency over our bodies, bodily autonomy, reproductive freedom and justice. Uh, and so, or the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. So again, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. And what I want is for, uh, I look forward to this vote coming to the floor so that we can get every senator on record. What side of history are you on? You have undermined progress, obstructed justice time and time again. You have another opportunity to do the right thing, to do the right thing consistent with the will of the people. Majority of Americans support Roe v. Wade and do not want it overturned. Uh, so let's uh, get a vote, get folks on the record. And if they're on the wrong side of history, then let's put them on notice. Because again, at this point, when you look at the, the layered systematic oppression and denial of black America, from voting rights to the George Floyd justice and policing bill, and now to this issue, uh, Roland, let's remember the, the history of this. Uh, abortion uh, bans and uh, this protest is rooted in white supremacy, and black women have disproportionately bore the brunt of this every time. We have experienced forced sterilization, forced hysterectomies. We have uh, record high maternal morbidity. And, and now we are looking at a landscape where black women and the most marginalized, low-income, indigenous, disabled, LGBT could be living under a state of forced birth. And then, Roland, we have done nothing on universal child care and pre-K, and we've done nothing on paid leave. Well, that, 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 that's one of the points that I have long uh, stated. Um, former NFL player Ben Watson, uh, Benjamin Watson, has a documentary out that deals with this whole issue uh, of uh, abortion. Uh, and he interviewed me for the documentary. And I said, I said, nah, I think these folks are more anti-abortion than they are pro-life. I said, because you can't be the governor of Mississippi, uh, Tate Reeves, and you're commenting on this, but then you have done nothing about the infant mortality rate in Mississippi. You have all these conservatives who are talking about the importance of getting rid of Roe v. Wade, but they've been quiet about black women who have lost, uh, who have died during childbirth. Uh, right. Then, of course, when you talk about uh, prenatal care, when you talk about Head Start, so I said, what is it? Is it, do you only care about the fetus in the womb, but once it is a child, then you don't give a damn? But, Roland, but that's the point. The, the hypocrisy and the contradictions abound. You cannot lecture folks about civil liberties. And then uh, the thing that is most critical to my freedom, my liberation, is agency and autonomy over my own body. Uh, it is, uh, uh, again, I, and I've yet to get an appropriate answer uh, whenever I ask that particular question. Let me ask you about student loan debt, uh, because uh, this is also a critical issue. We've got midterm elections coming up. Uh, in uh, about uh, uh, six months. Uh, uh, President Joe Biden, his, his numbers among young voters have fallen through the floor. His numbers among, Af among African Americans are down. Uh, people are saying, hey, how have Democrats delivered? Now, there are a lot of things that y'all delivered in the House, but it's been blocked uh, in the Senate. I do it all the time. I do it all the time. So I, when all these people uh, come at me saying, well, the CBC hasn't done anything, I remind them that you only have two CBC members in the Senate, but you have most of them in the House. And they, these bills, George Floyd Justice Act got passed in the House. Uh, all the, numerous other bills got passed in the House, but they're not in the Senate. And so uh, I've heard you, I've heard Senator Elizabeth Warren and others say the president has the authority to cancel student loan debt. Why won't he? What I'm trying to understand, what is the holdup? Yeah, well, first, well, let me just say this. We are closer than ever before to getting this done. And canceling student debt, since you uh, contextualize it, it within the midterms, is, is both good policy and good politics. Because it's our job as lawmakers to be responsive to the needs of people, where there is hardship to alleviate it, we're in the business of solving problems. This is a nearly $2 trillion crisis. And the, the, the multi-racial uh, generational movement 
which made this Democratic majority possible, was comprised of issues-based activists, many of them uh, who wanted action on student debt cancellation. And myself, Leader Schumer, Senator Warren, Rep. Omar, and others, we've been leading this fight. We were successful in getting the administration to put a pause on student loan payments during the pandemic, three pauses. And we saw people, I heard from many, especially uh, black folk, uh, Roland, who used those monies instead to remain safely housed, to purchase essential goods. Some became first-generation home buyers. We see the presidents of HBCUs using federal funds, the ARPA funds, to cancel debt. And we know that our HBCUs have been chronically and woefully underfunded. All the needs that they have from infrastructure A to Z, and they're using those funds to cancel student debt, which proves it's a racial justice issue. Black students have 85 percent takeout loans, and then we are five times more likely to default. Black women carry the most debt, are burdened by the most, 20 percent more than our white counterparts, 50 percent uh, more than white men. Joe Biden has the authority. We're closer than ever before. He has signaled that he will cancel some debt. And I'm going to keep uh, banging the drum for broad-based student debt uh, cancellation by $50,000, because that will support the uplift of 80 percent of those in the lowest income brackets. Roland, there was a false narrative saying this was regressive in impact. It was only going to benefit white graduate students who went to affluent institutions. That is a complete falsehood. This, like everything else, like everything else, the burden falls the heaviest on white Americans. And because of policies like redlining, our families didn't get to build generational wealth. We borrow the most. We default the most. This is an economic justice issue. It's a racial justice issue. And it will jumpstart the economy, Roland. It's an effective strategy um, as we begin to round the corner and head into a recovery from this pandemic-induced recession. It doesn't, and it doesn't require one vote from Congress. One vote, unilateral action, executive stroke of a pen. So just do it, Joe. Just do it. Uh, well, what is strange to me is when I listen to uh, folks on the right uh, who say that, uh, well, oh, my mom worked hard to send me to college uh, and we should be paying these folks' debts off. Um, didn't the federal government forgive a ton of PPP loans? Didn't the federal government um, give our financial institutions trillions of dollars or access to trillions during the economic crisis. So I, I'm, I'm just, it, it's just really interesting when I listen. I mean, look, the proposal to send $40 billion to Ukraine. I, I'm, I'm just saying, if, if we're willing to send billions to Ukraine, how is it that we're unwilling to actually say, let's help American students with debt? Roland. It's society that maintains that we live in a meritocracy. And they told black folks that education is the great equalizer. And if we pursued higher education, we would close the racial wealth gap. It has only exacerbated it. The fact that our families did not have equitable access to the GI Bill, the impact of uh, policies, discriminatory policies like redlining, we borrow more, we default more, we're saddled by more. He can do something about it. Economic justice issue, racial justice issue, and it's a winning issue. It's responsive to the needs of the coalition which elected this president. This is a hardship burdening people from every walk of life. Roland, I have parents saying I am in my upper 60s. I cannot retire because I signed Parent PLUS loans for my kid or I'm still paying on my loans, and now I'm paying on my kids' loans. 76-year-olds in my district, so fixed income, still paying student loans. A whole generation that can't start a family, grow a family, purchase a home, start a business. So this $2 trillion debt is choking at the promise of this country. And finally, Roland, for those people that would say, well, I, I paid my way, look, the price of higher education has increased by 150 percent. Well, not only that, I also remind people that, like, in uh, New York, the city colleges of New York, it used to be free. So it's a whole well, generation... I, it's a whole I, generation I, of white people who actually got college degrees for free. Roland, that's right, but that's why we have to invest 
in education as the public good that it is. We do need tuition-free college. We do need to expand Pell Grants. We do need to invest in our HBCUs. So this is not the whole problem, but this is a bold step in the right direction. And listen, Roland, at first, this was an issue they really marginalized. And as I said, there was a false narrative about it. But we have been vigilant in our advocacy. We have lifted the voices of those who've been burdened by this debt, and we are closer than ever before to getting this done. All right. Congressman Yana Presley, always glad to have you on the show. Welcome back anytime. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Let's go to our panel here. Mustafa Santiago Ali, former senior advisor to the EPA. Uh, Teresa Lundy, TML Communications, glad to have uh, both of you here. Um, you know, both of these issues are going to be major in, no in November. So on one hand, uh, Teresa and Mustafa, uh, on one hand, you people are saying it could be a rallying cry, if you will, uh, to Dems if the Supreme Court actually uh, tr overturns Roe v. Wade or returns the power to the states. On the flip side, it's a lot of people who are saying they flat out are not going uh, to vote if you don't see student loan debt. They say Biden promised it, Harris promised it, it hasn't happened. Uh, Mustafa, is this, uh, the student loan debt, is this an issue that Democrats had better understand unless you deal with you are going to cause young voters to say, ain't interested in the midterms? Without a doubt. I mean, I talk and I work with young people all across the country, and this is incredibly important to them. One, as you stated, there was the promise from the president that he would move forward on this. And the other part of it is that in our communities, we understand the black-white wealth gap that exists. We also understand that there's discrimination in employment, which continues to impact us. We also understand that our parents have less money to be able to help us to go to school. We also understand that there is predatory institutions uh, that we are often pushed into, or our institutions are less resourced so that folks don't get that financial help from a school, if you will. And then, of course, there's discrimination in the credit market. All of these things come together for significant impacts uh, and continue to expand the black-white wealth gap that exists in our country. So if folks want our vote, then they most definitely should be moving forward uh, on addressing the student loan issues that are literally stopping us from being able to pursue the American dream with any type of real vigor. Um, when uh, Vice President Kamala Harris appeared on uh, Joe Madison's show, um, she actually uh, talked about this. Uh, this is what uh, Joe pa posted uh, on his social media pages dealing with, from, uh, from the interview on Sirius XM Radio. On people having to pay um, their, their student loans because, of course, during the course of the pandemic, um, people have suffered greatly in terms of their sources of income, their ability to work um, and pay their bills. So we put a pause on it. I, you know, I will tell you, Joe, for me, this is personal. I had student loans. You know, I'd have to sit there. I finally paid them off, but sit down with that little, you know, that little coupon book and write that check every month um, in addition to, you know, rent and everything else. And, and it's real. It's a real issue. Um, and we, we really need to give people a little breathing room to get back on their feet during the course of this pandemic, after the, the pandemic. And so we're going to keep focusing on borrowers in need. And the pause, I think, will be a, a good lifeline um, for allowing people to rebuild um, from the pandemic. And I, I assume this will be revisited after the pause in August. I intend to revisit it for sure. It's something okay. I care deeply about. Right. It's something I care deeply about. It is personal to me. I, you know, I also know that when we look at how it affects different populations based on race, um, that our black students and graduates um, tend to graduate, especially if they're coming from an HBCU, with more debt than other students, and that it has a direct impact on whether that student, that graduate, can buy a home or start a family, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, or get through the month. It's, it's a real issue. So, uh, it is a real issue for so many different people. And, and again, uh, the politics of this, the politics of this, um, the, that is, uh, the White House has to understand that it is real. 
and people are pissed that they have not moved. Yes, they, for, they, 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 they've done loan forgiveness, uh, and now it's around $20 billion. But that's not the same as student loan, canceling student loan debt. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, if we do not pay attention to um, actually what's going on uh, with people and their um, ability to live not only day to day, but month to month and year to year, especially during a pandemic, then I believe, you know, we're, we're almost asking the American people to not pay attention to, you know, what's going on in our, in our government. So, like, even during the pandemic, um, you know, uh, Yes, we've had about three to four months of not paying a student loan debt, but what happens after that? You know, what happens when you know, the funds have been exhausted, right? As it just was with the EIDL loan for small businesses. So there are so many um, issues that, you know, are currently happening where, you know, it feels like, you know, as Rep. Ayanna Presley already said, this could literally been taken care of with a stroke of a pen, but for some reason, it's an issue that keeps going down the line and into another scenario or situation, which again, causes everyone to question, what is the real agenda here? What is the real priority? Because it seems like the priority is not to make sure financial wellness is happening. It seems like cities and states are, you know, doing new tax assessments, which are actually increasing property values for individuals who are um, currently in a home. And it's not eliminating the debt. It seems like once we get out the pandemic, we have to do more starting over and more um, preparation on uh, what the future actually looks like financially than we actually do now. And it's actually a disgrace since we're sending um, money to various institutions and organizations, um, but something that they could clearly do with a stroke of a pen is not something that is a high priority. Mario, again, uh, it comes down to elections, comes down to votes. And if you don't have people turning out in your favor, you're going to lose. Uh, right now, Dem Democrats are not doing themselves any favors uh, by not moving on student loan debt. Uh, and I don't know what the hell they're waiting for, just like I have no idea what the hell they're waiting for when it comes to issuing executive orders dealing with criminal justice reform. Uh, to me, uh, they're reaching a point of no return uh, because if you do it so damn late, it's going to look like you're pandering, uh, but they better get a move on it. Otherwise, they are guaranteeing they will lose the House and the Senate in 2023. Absolutely. It's good to see everybody uh, again this week. I missed you guys from last week. Listen, all we need to know about the Democrats is what we saw from uh, Nancy Pelosi, the video where she's talking about we need a strong Republican Party. This shows you that they're so out of touch with reality. What we need is people to do the actual bills and laws that helps regular Americans. And that's not what's happening. One thing about it is, Roland, you got to respect the Republicans because they tell the truth to their base. They say, look, when we get in there, this is what we're going to do, and they do it. The Democrats say one thing and they do another thing. As Teresa said, it's a stroke of a pen, and they refuse to do it, and they're just going back on a campaign promise. So why will people be incentivized to come out and vote for them? I mean, a legitimate, a legitimate question, particularly for younger folks. Yeah, we understand it. We're going to vote in every election. We understand the history of it. We understand why it's important. But you telling people that just came out of an election cycle saying, hey, you got to vote. This is it matters. And if you vote for me, I'm going to do I'm going to do this. And then they don't do it. So someone's saying, well, I'm going to go stand in line for eight hours again in the heat for them to again lie about it. It doesn't make any sense outside the fact that the Democrats are not serious about power. They're certainly not serious about helping black people. And they're not even serious about um, uh, keeping Republicans out of office, because as Nancy Pelosi said, we need Republicans. All right, folks, hold tight one second. We come back. Um, a Georgia family is asking why was their son killed by police? It's a refrain we keep hearing from so many families across the country. We'll discuss that next right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Uh, if you're on YouTube and Facebook, be sure to hit that like button, share button. Also, uh, download our Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Also, be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club where every dollar you give goes to support this show. You can send a check on money order to PO Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 
cash at 0196. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, you're going to learn about the silver tsunami, which means that a million people are turning 65 every day and they're going to need some kind of care. You're going to meet two sisters whose situation with their own family led them to start a business in this industry and now they're showing others. This is our passion, our mission, our purpose, our ministry that's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat, the Black Tape, with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Yo, it's your man Dion Cole from Blackish, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Stay woke. It has been a year, and a Georgia family still wants to know why DeKalb County police shot and killed their beloved son and brother. Matthew Zadok Williams was gunned down in his own home after someone called police, reporting him as suspicious. When police arrived, Williams panicked, went into a mental health crisis, and locked himself in his home. The police asked him to leave. The police then kicked in Williams, kicked at Williams' door several times before shooting. Now, the video we're about to play is certainly triggering to a lot of different people, so we want you to give, take, give you an opportunity uh, to turn away, uh, to um, walk out of the room, and, or, or uh, shield it from your children. Uh, and so, uh, as we often do with these videos, and so let's go ahead and play it now. Let us be in. Put the knife down. Put the knife down. Put the knife down. Put the knife down. I think. Put the knife. Put the knife down. Put the knife down. Put the knife down. Put the knife down. Please go upstairs. Put the knife down. Too many people right here. Too many people right here. Back away. Right here. Sir, put the knife down. My property, sir. Put the knife. Come out and talk to me, man. Hey, I'm, I'm about to go to the seat. Okay. Come out and talk to us. Put the knife down, man. Put the knife down. You ain't gonna defend nothing. Sir, you broke into my property, sir. Sir, put the knife down, man. Just put the knife. Just put the knife down. Forty one, Radio. You have a ten three. Yeah. All right, we're going to back off with him. He's, we're going to back off. The bullets that killed Williams came from Sergeant Devon Perry's gun. Williams was not rendered aid for more than an hour and a half. The medical examiner says Williams died a slow, painful death. We're joined now by Matthew Williams' mother, uh, Chris Ann Lewis, his sisters Hannah, and Dr. Beulah Williams, uh, as well as attorney uh, Maule Mel Davis uh, from Atlanta. So I, I'm okay. I, 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 I need to understand w what I just saw. So someone called police because they say he was acting suspicious. Who called police? And how do they define suspicious? What? Was he walking around his own front yard? Was he with a knife? Was he yelling, screaming? What was suspicious? Well, Roland, that's the, that's the question. It was a, a white woman who was new to the area and did not acknowledge that he lived there. In fact, she said that he didn't live there, which was completely false. He had been a homeowner and owned that home since 2009. 
And so this uh, white woman says that he was um, squatting, trespassing, and that led to this um, crazed police action. But it was, it's this misinformation which sent the police down the entirely wrong track. Um, and that's why the law enforcement officers should not have just believed what she said without doing, doing their own due diligence. And it's unfortunate that, that we're here. Um, but that's the quote unquote suspicious activity is that he was locked out of his home. He had a, a plumber's knife trying to re-enter his home. And um, that was it. And, so and so it, 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 is that true? Was he locked out of his home? Correct. He was locked out of his own home. He had a plumber's knife. We believe he was doing some repairs on his home. And that's when police approached him and he's on his own porch. But because this woman says that he did not live there, then they treat him as a trespasser versus treating him as a homeowner. Um... Okay. What? So, um, Chris Ann, Hannah, and, and, and Dr. Bueller, um, had your son, your brother, had he had mental episodes before? What was described here is that he panicked. Um, what was his history um, when it came to uh, mental issues, or was this simply an isolated incident? So, my brother, um... And first of all, thank you for having us on the show. We appreciate that. Um, my brother, from what we know about his mental health, is that a couple of years, maybe around 2000, end of 2018 or so, he was robbed at some point at a convenience store by his home. Um, since then, he progressively got to the point where he didn't want to leave his house. Um, we didn't understand why. We could not figure it out. Um, it got particularly concerning in 2019. Now, now, when you say you almost, I'm sorry. When you say we couldn't figure it out, were, we you, were, 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 were you aware that he had been robbed? Yes, we knew that. Got it. But got it. His girlfriend told us that he had been robbed, and from that point, it was a progression of him not leaving the house. And then yeah. The and he, I mean, that, that was that, that's a that's a that's a traumatic experience. Uh, that and we, we often have seen that when women have been sexually assaulted uh, and there's fear of going jogging or leaving their home as well. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, you know, starting in 2019, um, it just got a little bit worse where it was the point where he was only coming out of his house for maybe three seasons, and that was to get his mail, take out his trash, and work on his plumbing. Um, when the 20 came, pandemic here, nobody's leaving the house. So it became less of a concern for us as a family to figure out what was going on. Uh, the entire time, we're in close communication with my brother. Somebody sees him at least on a weekly basis. Um, we bring him food. We talk to him on the phone all the time. We have a family chat line. Um, we have still are in relationship with my brother, but we could not figure out why it was that he didn't want to come out the house. And as a family, we just didn't know what, what that was. We, we, we tried to figure it out, but we couldn't. Um, our brother was very highly intelligent. He was also, um, you know, just a person that would not allow, you know, a lot of questions for his sister. He had five older sisters. He's a baby brother, so it was not, I just couldn't put him, you know, on the witness stand and interrogate him about anything, you know? So it wasn't as if, you know, he would answer our questions, but he had, he had normal conversation with him. We were in a relationship with him. We knew something was going on. We just couldn't figure out what it was. But um, what happened on April the 12th, as far as his mental health crisis outside, he had never seen anything like that before. So I, the, the, you know, this is a per, this is a, so, so in watching the video, obviously the officers are trying to communicate with him um, and they're trying to get him to come out of the home. You, you hear them say on numerous occasions for him to drop the knife. Um, and, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if the reaction from the police department has been, look, uh, they did their job. They tried to, uh, they tried to get him to come out and talk to establish, establish who he was. But, but, but what this, still goes to, and I say this all the time, uh, Chris Ann, is that 
Police are simply incapable of handling situations when there's mental illness involved. Their reaction is to shoot to kill. Mm -hmm. And this is when people have been talking about defund the police. Part of this discussion has been to shift resources away from just police departments and then send mental health professionals to be able to, uh, to, to reduce the situation, the tensions, because here's the reality. Um, they could have sat there for two hours or three hours or four hours. There was no need to shoot to kill. There was no need to shoot in the first place. Um, it was nothing that my brother did to deserve those shots to be fired into his home. And, and oh, Roland... The Cab County has a mental health policy, as my Lord, as Molly can explain to you. The Cab County has a mental health policy. That's the first of four policies that they broke. They should have no notified whoever is on the... Whatever their procedure is, they should have followed their own mental health policy and my son would be alive today. So the county has one, meaning those officers could have pulled back, made a phone call, gotten a mental health professional out there to, to, to help defuse the situation, and they did. Yes. Roland, it, it wasn't that they, it wasn't just a question of should they, they were required to. That's what people are missing. They were required, once he was in his home, barricaded in his home, and he was not coming out, they were required to contact SWAT and a negotiator and then contact the family. That's per DeKalb County regulations. They violated their own regulations by deciding that they just are going to kick the door in when there's no threat to them. He's behind a closed door. Right. They're on the other side of the door. And they decide, we're going to just kick the door in and start shooting. And, and, and that's totally inconsistent. And, and that's what, what I saw with the video there, uh, in that he's behind the door. They're saying, drop the knife. Um, and, and again, it reminds me, uh, it reminds me of the, first of all, there, there's so many other cases, but it reminds me of the Kojima Powell case uh, in uh, St. Louis, where you know, mentally disturbed, he had like a butter knife, Cops come on the scene, and it's literally 16 seconds from the door opening to seven shots fired, killing him, uh, where he sort of flexes at the cops, and they immediately fire. They literally could have retreated behind the car. I mean, he did not have to be killed. Or the young man in Dallas, whose bl black, black mom called the cops, and the young man was playing with the screwdriver. He was not even charging the cops, and within 20 seconds, he's dead. Uh, and so, I mean, th th this sort of goes on and on and on, and these, these officers are simply incapable of dealing with this situation. And if you're sitting, he's behind a closed door, and you say a knife, he's not firing at you, so you're, 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 your life is not in danger. Correct. That's exactly it. That's been our point. Um, go to my panel, uh, De DeMario. Question, comment. Man, I'm just so sorry for this loss for your son. This was ridiculous. I just filed a case just today here in Tulsa with a similar situation with a client. Unfortunately, she was not killed. There was no reason that the lawyer, your lawyer has already stated, there's no urgency here. Your son was not posing a threat. There's absolutely no reasons for those officers to be doing what they were doing. And they their tactics were so terrible. They they're standing in front of each other with guns out. I mean, everything about this is ridiculous. They should all have been fired and actually prosecuted. Where are you in the stage of the case? Have you filed a case yet? What is the DA saying there? This is ridiculous. And before you answer that question, I think this also speaks to, highlights the point, it's not about skin color. Everybody said, oh, we need more black officers. The officers yeah. I saw in that video were yeah. both black. But it's the culture of the police departments that they have no accountability and they can do what they want. <coughs> we, uh, we've, lost, we've lost your attorney, but if y'all could go ahead and comment on the state of the case, so, please. Um, I'm an attorney as well, and I'm, I'm his sister, obviously. But yes, I love everything that you just said. Um, as far as the status of the case, the DA is, has had to file since July, the DBI file, and she has yet to make a decision. Um, the latest comment we got from her office is that she's close. Um, she's still investigating. So it's been a 
a year. There's been no decision. The DC has not made a decision on whether she's going to be charged or not. This is the issue we've all said in the county. As far as the administrative investigation, the CEO of Berman's office, the officers are still working. They have not even been placed on administrative leave. We've had a meeting with CEO Mike Berman and asked that these officers be put on administrative leave or fired. <laughs> this proves that these officers violated four policies when they killed my brother and left him to die. Yet they are still walking feet and they are still working in uniform and have not been disciplined. Um, so that's the status of the case right now. And the thing that bothers me most is although there are four policies that were that they didn't follow, failure to activate mental health, failure to uh, uh, activate SWAT, use as excessive force, but the worst is when they refuse to render care. My son right. died from a non-fatal gunshot wound to the shoulder. <coughs> Slow, agonizing <coughs> death. My daughter, my daughter can speak to this. You? Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Of all the policies that were violated, uh, we can't. Yeah, we can't hear you. So speak up, please. Of all the policies that were violated, that's the one policy that just really sticks with us. The, the fact that they, after they fired those last shots, you can hear Officer Perry say, "We're going to back down now," and he just walked away. Those shots were fired at close range. So they had time to then regroup and just think about him as a person that, you know, just think about his life. But they just, they walked away. And you know, there was an EMS um, professional on the scene who offered his help, and he was turned away. So we just can't get over that. Um, it's just disgusting. You know, it's disgusting, and, it's, and then your lawyer knows this. It's not just the four policies they broke, but it's unconstitutional policing. That is the, the disastrous, it's outrageous. I'm so sorry you guys are going through that. I hope that you can get that DA to move. She's just sitting on this, the decision is clear, and I hope you can get this case moving when you get it filed, and you can get everything that you can from her. But I understand because I do these cases every single day. Nothing can bring your son back. That was a horrendous shooting, and my heart just goes out to you. And I'm glad you have competent counsel Thank to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. The, so uh, to, so the, the case that you have filed, obviously you're waiting on the DA to make a decision, uh, but uh, for your attorney, what is the status of your case? Uh, have you filed that case? In, no. in, go ahead. No, we, ha we haven't filed. Uh, we have, the, the way it works in Georgia is they will not release any of the of the files. We were able to, because of the diligence of this family and the community outrage, we were able to get the police to release the body cam footage, which is really unheard of in Georgia. This, it just doesn't happen in Georgia. It's very different from most um, jurisdictions around the country. But what they won't release is the entire GBI, Georgia Bureau of Investigation report. And so we have really focused our energy with this family on hoping that this district attorney will prosecute the case. Once that decision is made and they release the file, then we'll file a civil litigation and move forward with the constitutional uh, violation that these officers uh, perpetrated against Mr. Williams. All right. Um, certainly uh, keep us abreast of what happens next uh, in this case. Uh, indeed, uh, it is sad. Thank you so very much. And again, we're sorry for your loss. Thank you. Um, Mustafa, the, the thing that we constantly say on this show is, again, how are police departments not realizing now you cannot handle mental health issues with guns? Too many people. We see case after case, folks are dead because cops fired on them having a mental health breakdown. They still don't see us as human, and that's the problem. That means that we never get the benefit of the doubt. You know, they always go to the most dangerous way of dealing with us. Um, there are examples of how some police departments have been forced to change. In Denver, there's a STAR program that's there, where they make sure they have the, the mental health <coughs> practitioners who are part of it. Uh, I think over the last year, 
Yeah, there was about 1,300 calls that came in, and because those individuals were the ones uh, who were engaging, um, you know, lot, no lives were lost, no assaults, uh, and actually folks weren't even arrested because they gave folks space that was necessary to be able to, you know, walk them through and talk them through the situations that were going on. It's unfortunate that the folks there in Georgia didn't follow the, you know, the precedent that they have in place or the policy they have in place and that brother would still be with us. But, you know, it goes down to they just don't value our lives. And when they don't value our lives, these are the types of things that play out each and every time. Teresa. Yeah, it's truly a disgrace. Um, you know, here in Philly, we actually had a similar situation um, about a year ago. And, uh, um, um, you know, it's like we keep advocating for training. We keep advocating, you know, for cops to do their job as they're asking for increased funding. And it's like these things are happening. So, again, I'm going to go back to my point about how we need to look at leadership that it has been um, entrenched in the police department. It looks like when police chiefs are in there, they've had over, you know, 30 and 40 years of experience, but sometimes their traditions are not allowing them to change their ways of how they govern their police department. And so if they think things are just going to stay as usual and they think it's just politics of, you know, how what people are saying in those communities when their families are dying, then we're going to keep having these situations. That's why, again, going back to your point, Roland, about why voting matters, district attorneys matter, um, you know, uh, police commissioners matter, uh, elected officials matter. But we have to start asking them questions when they are running on this progressive agenda, because progressive agenda sometimes isn't always right, right? But we got to do something. So, you know, we got to go back uh, to the point of being <laughs> aware, being humane about individuals and people and not just about the badge. Uh, indeed, indeed. So um, it just keeps happening. And again, uh, at some point, uh, people are going to learn, in this case, they literally didn't even follow their own procedures. Procedures were put in place to prevent this very thing. Cops didn't follow it. I don't understand how they still have a job. It makes no sense to me. All right, folks, going to go to a break. We come back. We're going to talk to the president of Fisk University uh, about uh, some innovative things that are happening on uh, that campus in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, folks, don't forget, uh, please, if you're on YouTube, y'all hit the like button, okay? Almost 2,000 of y'all. Why are we hitting 1,000 likes by now? It ain't that hard. Click like. Facebook, same thing. Click like. If you're commenting on the Black Star Network app, please uh, drop the comments. We'd love to hear what you have to say uh, as well. Folks, uh, download the Black Star Network app on available on all platforms, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And of course, uh, please join our Brina Funk fan club where every dollar you give goes to support this show uh, and what we do. Uh, and so <clears throat> please do that. We appreciate that. Our goal is to get 20,000 fans on an annual basis to contribute 50 bucks each. Uh, there's no minimum, there's no maximum. And so uh, that's $4.19 a month, 13 cents a day. And we appreciate every dollar that you actually give. Uh, you can send a check of money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. You can also uh, give you a cash app, dollar sign RM Unfiltered. Uh, PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Uh, Zale is Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. And of course, all the folks who give during the show will get uh, a personal shout out while we are live. We'll be right back. Hmm. Why is it so hard to see Panther? What Bruh. deal? Wow. I mean, if you go to Amazon, I think I tried. Yeah. So I have a collection of. of That's of, a hard of, movie. They charge you three hundred dollars on Amazon. I was like, I'm not about to pay no four hundred dollars for yeah. a VHS cop. Yeah. What's the deal? Man, it is it is interesting, Rowan. It is the movie they don't want you to see. Power to the people. It's funny. I made New Jack City. You can get it anywhere. Posse, you can see it anywhere. But but a movie that says that it is not an accident that we medicated 
the black communities right around the time when they were getting militant, when you had the Panthers starting to organize, the people starting to vote and march on Washington, we, we let these communities get med medicated. In fact, that comes up in The Godfather, you know, where they say, as long as it stays in the mm -hmm. black communities. So we asked the question, they tried to say, ask us questions. I asked them, the, the reporters when we did, I said, listen, why is it a 13-year-old boy in the hood can find a, a way to buy a gun, some liquor, or church, or some crack, and yet you can't find them to arrest those people? You can't arrest that deal. Why is that? Next on A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, summertime when the living is easy, or is it? Summer vacations, class reunions, kids in summer camp, all fun, but stressful. You need to get into a summer mindset and have a plan. Oh yes, our panel gives us their favorite summer planning hacks on a next A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie here at Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives and we're gonna talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Hello, I'm Bishop T.D. Jake. Hi, y'all doing? It's your favorite funny girl, Amanda Seals. Hi, I'm Anthony Brown from Anthony Brown and Group Therapy. What up, Lana Well, and you are watching Rolling Martin Unfiltered. All right, fam, uh, Fisk University. Uh, I just completed, of um, course, uh, a, uh, being the Rebus Mitchell uh, Scholar in Residence at Fisk University. And a lot of great things are happening uh, on that campus uh, in Nashville. Uh, joining us right now uh, to talk about that is the president of Fisk University, uh, Van Newkirk. Uh, Doc, how you doing? Uh, doing well, doing well, enjoying the weather and enjoying being on your show today. So uh, let's 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 talk about uh, what, what what's been going on there. Um, first and foremost, uh, COVID impacted uh, your university, like so many others as well. Uh, and so tell us how uh, you're doing now uh, with Fisk, uh, you know, as we are still dealing with it, but uh, not in the same way as we were before. Well, we're a small university, but one of the things we did, we very student-centered university. We saw our enrollment grow during COVID and our students were more engaged because what we did as a faculty and as a staff is that we were engaged in contact, constant contact with our students. Uh, we had activities for our students. And what we saw was that an enrollment surge at the university. So that was unusual because as a small institution, we've been under a thousand students. Right now, we are just, uh, almost at a thousand we plan to have 1500 next year so all of that's going well because of what's happening with this university and the first that we have at this university so you saw a surge uh was that because uh folks were actually going to going to school online well no we didn't have that many online we kept our campus operational but we did have more online courses but what happened here was that the name of the university and what we do for students uh, what we found out was right before the uh, pandemic broke out, we had a lot of relationships that we uh, submitted on Wall Street. We submitted relationships with companies across the nation. And what we have discovered was that students who've been out of this university three years, the average income is $73,000. And so what we found is that there was a lot of interest in what we were doing to turn out uh, turnkey ready students. And that interest permeated this nation right as the per, uh, pandemic hit. So that helped us with our enrollment and that helped us with our retention because we saw our retention rates surge up to about 80% as a small institution. Um, and uh, and so uh, obviously, uh, you said, again, you said you kept it open and uh, how are you now uh, building upon that? How are you now um, getting your board of trustees 
uh, to understand what Fisk should be looking like in the 21st century as opposed to its rich history. Because th that's the one thing that, as I travel around the country, as I've talked to many HBCUs, I mean, and again, I've probably visited now up more than 65. And the, the fundamental problem that I continue to see is you have a strong contingent of alumni who want to hold on to the old university, whether it's the old Fisk, the old South Carolina State, uh, you know, the old Prairie View. But the reality is that you've got to be, you've got to be operating uh, in a new world, new technology. All these things have changed. Uh, and you've got folks who are insistent on new buildings, but other people are going to technology and online learning. Uh, others are saying that, oh, we should be building more dormitories. Well, others are saying, no, we should be expanding our national footprint by driving folks online. So how have you been uh, leading uh, the university and getting your faculty, your staff, your students, and your board to understand that you have to operate in a new paradigm, which requires, re requires a paradigm shift? Well, one of the things we started was before the pandemic, we started an academic inventory shift. Uh, we are a liberal arts institution, but we started a whole movement uh, to new types of programs. We have digital media, we have uh, bioinformatics at this university. These are new majors that came about uh, 2018, 2019. Uh, we started a bioengineering program. All of those programs came about to give us that new footprint that we need to be into the modern world. And then we started tying our programs to industry, as we talked about Wall Street. So we have our first new building on this campus. Uh, it will be uh, in 50 years. That building is tying our academic programs to industry. We, so we have uh, a whole facilities that is set up so that industry can come to this campus, meet with our students. They can help design our majors and curriculum. That's helping us to get into this modern world and, and ensuring that our students have a footprint uh, that's going to be a footprint that people are looking for and not the footprint of old. And that's one of the things that's helping Fisk to actually transcend the pandemic and to move forward in, in the age that we're in right now. And as you know, we're an institution of first. And uh, going along with those new majors, we're doing some things that we've never done before in an HBCU. We have our first uh, gymnastics program, the first HBCU with the gymnastics program. And then we got innovative. We went online and went to eBay. We're a small school, don't have a lot of money. We bought a 5,000-seat football stadium, but we don't plan to play football on eBay, which is unique because what we wanted to do is have places for our students to actually uh, uh, have athletics and to uh, experience sports, but we did that in a cost-efficient way, a 5,000-seat steel stadium for $30,000. Uh, those things are the things that I think make an institution unique, and those are the things that I think uh, help us to actually compete in this modern age because those types of innovations, we're catching the, the eyes of industry across not only the nation, but across Tennessee and, and the world. And that's helping us tremendously. So let's talk about uh, this uh, new initiative when it comes to FISC now being involved in venture capital. Yeah, well, this is, this is very important for us because as we expand our footprint, as we said in the Wall Street, we're getting people who are investing in our university to venture capital. Uh, and that's helping us to actually build our endowment uh, to grow this university. We had an endowment that was less than $20 million a few years ago. Our endowment right now is still small, but it's almost doubled as a result of having this new investment and people looking at this university as what it can do. And I think that's the important aspect for any institution people and the investment in the institution and making sure that we have trustees who are buying into this process. That's what's helping us to grow and to build our university. Questions from our panel. Teresa, you're first. Well, I think this is a great opportunity. Um, so I, I guess what is more in store for the university? Um... I'm sorry, I don't think uh, Van uh, heard your question. So, guys, fix uh, Teresa's audio. Mustafa, what's your question? Uh, yeah. uh, President, you, you mentioned two of the new programs that you yeah. uh, instituted uh, to be a part of the 21st century. Those new programs, oh, are they uh, actually pulling in new students at the same rate as some of the traditional programs that Fisk is known for? 
that we've started a program that ties us to our past. We started a social justice program, the only master's program in the nation in social justice. And as you know, we are the birthplace of social justice, and those programs are helping us to compete. They're giving us the students that uh, we once had and students that never thought about Fisk University are coming to this university to get what we have to offer. So I think that's the, the key part, is having programs that tie us to the future, but also tie our past to the future. DeMario. Yes, um, really nice to talk with you tonight, President. Uh, you know, I represent the survivors of the Tulsa Race Massacre, and one of the victims of the Tulsa Race Massacre was a doctor by the name of Dr. A.C. Jackson, and he was a graduate of Fisk University uh, Medical School. So my question is, is the medical school still in operation? I'm not for sure about that. And if so, what is the plans to continue to utilize that medical school to continue to bring people to, to your campus? Well, you know, Meher is next door to us. And if you look at our main and, field, and literally next door. <laughs> just across the street. And if you look at our main building, the steps to our main building lead down to Meharry. But that's because when students graduated from Fisk, the thought was that they'd walk down the steps and go to Meharry. We actually gave the land uh, that Meharry sits on. Now, this is important for most people to know is that our largest major today is biology, and it's been biology. We have more women in biology who leave this institution and go on to become medical MDs than any institution in the nation. And that's because of our relationship with Meharry uh, next door. And that's still a, a very strong partnership, and it's a partnership that we cherish, and, and we uh, continue to counter promote as we go forward. So Meharry basically is the medical school of Fisk University uh, in terms of your partnership. Yep. All right, Teresa, I think we can hear you now. Your question for Dr. Newkirk. Yeah, well, congratulations um, on your, you know, uh, receiving the funds. Um, just a question about, um, is there any uh, new programs that you've um, develop in the midst of, um, you know, the pandemic or over time that's really engaged the students? Well, we have a new program in risk management that we are developing, and that's in partnership with a number of uh, major companies out of Chicago. And what we want to do is to make sure that our students are keeping in tune in our business program. Now, our business program is the second largest major on this campus. And what we're seeing in that new risk management program is that there's a renewed interest uh, a renews buzz. Uh, we have a, a major industry right here in town who gave us uh, money to endow a business professorship, and we have a second business endowed professorship in risk management that came about because of our initiative. So we see that that's going to be an area that we can grow, that we can get new partnerships. And what we are seeing more than anything else is that the number of applications and deposits that we have this year, they're almost double than what we had last year. And last year, we had one of our largest freshman classes. Uh, as a result, we're building our first new residence hall on this campus since 1961. And because of the expected growth, and our growth has been pretty consistent over the last five years, we're building our first new classroom building on this campus in science and in the STEM area since 1938. So we can see that it's all impacting our university and where we go. All right, then. Well, uh, Dr. Newkirk, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, great things are happening there at Fisk. Uh, and again, uh, under your leadership, uh, it is needed. A lot of people may not realize uh, that uh, for a few years ago, things were looking real dire for Fisk. Folks were even talking about the possibility of the university shutting its doors uh, due to financial issues. And so we're certainly glad to see if that is not the case. Thank you so much for having us. And, you know, we'd love to have everyone down to visit our campus because we're on a growth mode and we believe at this university uh, we're going to be, if not the best HBCU, but the best university in the nation. So we look forward to the growth and thank you for having us on. And I sent, uh, I'm, I'm in a chat group with your son and told him that he was, you're going to be on. And he said, quote, tell the old man I want him to babysit next month. <laughs> we're looking forward to it. <laughs> All right, then. I'll tell him that. All right. All right. Dr. Newkirk, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Uh, Thank our, you so much. Uh, and again, had a great time uh, being, uh, of course, a scholar in residence, uh, talking to the students there uh, at Fisk. So certainly had a good time. All right, folks, let's go talk about Grambling. Grambling State University, they've launched an investigation into the university's women's volleyball team after the school's new head coach 
literally cut all of her players a few months into the job. The university released this statement about the investigation. Uh, Grambling State University has engaged the National Law Office of Lewis, Brisbois, Biscard, and Smith LLP to conduct an independent review of the allegations involving the women's volleyball program. The review will be led by counsel who are experienced in legal matters involving collegiate athletics and NCAA compliance. A final report will be presented to GSU President Rick Gallo. As appropriate, any findings will be shared publicly. Now, uh, the review comes following the school's backlash after new coach Chad Chelsea Lucas cut all scholarship players from the team, 14 players, uh, soon after taking over. And those students uh, have taken to social media, uh, blasting her and the university. Uh, the athletic director says he stands behind uh, her decision. Uh, this took place, you know, this thing, this first um, uh, became public, uh, DeMario, about a month ago. And I said to folks, this is going to go national. Uh, I said, you know, it's, got, it's gotten some pickup. And, and the bottom line here is, if you're gonna, if you're gonna cut, first of all, people have to understand something, that uh, scholarships are not guaranteed. You know this. Uh, they're really called grant in aid, and that they can be pulled at any time by coaches. Uh, this obviously is a lot different when a new coach gets rid of all the players, all 14. Uh, and it has caused many of them to scramble, their family to scramble, how they're going to finish uh, paying for school, how to graduate. Uh, and so it certainly uh, has caused a lot of consternation uh, down at Grambling, but especially among these students and their families. Yeah, I'm not really sure exactly how the rules work with a, um, a non-championship level or, or like a D1 double A where Grambling is. So I don't understand how the coach was able to do this. It doesn't, it does, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's the same as he's in Oklahoma. And that is... Okay, that, well, if it's and, the same... And, yeah. yeah. Okay. If it's the same as Oklahoma, there should be some regulations there that... But I don't understand why the university needs to pay for an outside uh, law firm to come in and do an investigation. I mean, the university hired the coach. Aren't they on the campus with the coach? I mean, are they a legend? Normally, when these investigations are like my case when I'm suing the University of Iowa, when they're talking about, you know, racial discrimination or sexism or sexual assault. So it's really unusual to me to see why they need to hire a university, uh, hire a law firm. That's a very big law firm, prestigious law firm, going to be very, very expensive. I mean, what are they going to tell them that the university president or the athletic department, the director, couldn't go to the coach directly and, and find out why was this done? What are you trying to accomplish here? I mean, was it a scenario where she was saying, oh, you're cut, but you can reapply, you can retry out and just trying to motivate the players? I mean, I just don't understand what's going on here. And I certainly don't understand why grandma needs to hire an outside, outside law firm to, to discuss this with their own coach. I don't get it. Um, the thing here, um, uh, Mustafa, is if you look at this, uh, certainly the coach doesn't, doesn't make the decision just uh, on her own. Obviously had to consult with the athletic director, likely the president, uh, to make the decision. And if Grambling uh, went, with, went with that decision, to me, just come out publicly and walk people through, explain what happened, what led to this decision. All right. <clears throat> There should always be transparency in the process. When you don't, when you leave, you know, the, these gray areas or folks just don't know what's going on, then they're going to fill in their own sort of narratives about what's up. I mean, I was an athlete in college, and usually uh, for you to lose your scholarship, there usually has to be something significant that's going on. So the athletic director, the president, they had to have had, you know, those conversations about we're about to make a significant change. This wasn't about one athlete losing their scholarship. This is about the entire team. Um, so for them to make that type of a move means a whole bunch of folks had to be a part of the decision making. And it's just really disrespectful also to these young athletes because, you know, if you would give them a heads up, they could have made, you know, moves to another school. But when you do this, you know, you really put them at a significant disadvantage. And then you don't even think about, you know, the mental health aspects of the anxiety and depression that could come out of these types of things. Did I do something wrong as an athlete? Um, that made you make this choice are all these different questions that I'm sure are running through a whole bunch of people's minds, both the parents uh, and those young athletes. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this plays out. And I hope that, um, you know, there is real restitution for those young athletes um, who, you know, have their whole lives in front of them. And these types of things could actually, you know, create some barriers moving forward. Um, I remember when Steve Spurrier took over 
uh, as head football coach at the University of South Carolina, uh, Teresa. Uh, he came in and rescinded scholarship offers uh, that were made to some players by the previous coach. Uh, and again, a lot of people don't really understand uh, the reality of these, uh, these programs. They don't understand that again, that when someone awards you a scholarship, they say, oh, you get a four-year scholarship. Not true. They literally are one year grant in aid. And so your, a coach can literally pull your so-called scholarship after a year if they feel as if you're not performing. Uh, a lot of people have, have learned about this in the last number of years as we've talked about what's been happening on these uh, college campuses uh, with sports, and this is an example. And so uh, when you sign that letter of intent uh, to attend, it doesn't say no matter what you're going to get it, they can actually pull it for, for a variety of reasons. Yeah, and I find that interesting, but we have to think about the students in this matter, you know, those that, that have been, um, you know, putting in the athletic time and, and patience and also preparation to get to that point. And so when um, a student receives a scholarship, it's not, you know, just a, a, a welcoming of, you know, I'm going to do less work. It's in preparation, I'm going to do more work and hopefully, you know, be able to be on a collegiate level to do so. Um, I also find it very interesting uh, that this volleyball coach, uh, Chelsea Lucas, um, said her decision was not to bring back some of the current student athletes on the team. Um, but then it's like everybody's getting cut. So it's like you couldn't find, you know, at least one student that would be able to uh, maybe articulate the vision that you have. It, it almost seems like she did an episode of um, the movie, uh, well, I guess a, a segment from the movie Coach Carter, uh, but just a whole drastic way, you know, without really any purpose in doing so. Um, but you're right, it is their choice. Um, the NCAA and its independent investigation um, is definitely going to help. Anytime there is an independent investigation, that means something's going on with the politics on the inside of the institution. Um, and so... I'm hoping that, you know, we keep following this story um, because, again, we, we can't allow these students to lose out on the preparation of uh, essentially being a, a student athlete as they have to do a work-life balance. Um, again, so we're waiting to hear what happens there um, with this investigation. All right, final um, story. It, it, this, one, this is not an HBCU, uh, but it is at a predominantly black college. Uh, Lincoln College in Illinois has been around for 157 years. It is now slated to close. This is the New York Times story on Lincoln College. Uh, and uh, they were impacted by COVID, but they also were impacted by a ransomware attack that locked up the university's data. In this story, uh, they say that uh, potentially the university had to pay $100,000 to get their data back. Now, this is according to uh, the Chicago Tribune, less than 100,000, but here was the problem. They then began to realize they had significant enrollment shortfalls uh, and that it would require some $50 million for the university to stay open. Well, that is not the case. Uh, again, it is a very small uh, college in Illinois. Uh, again, as you see, they're again, founded in uh, 1865, named for Abra Abraham uh, Lincoln. And uh, it's a predominantly black college, but it is not an HBCU. Look, people keep saying the HBCU, and folks got to remember, just like we say, the PWIs, predominantly white institutions, where you have predominantly black institutions that are not HBCUs, such as Chicago State uh, University, that's right there in Chicago. They are a predominantly black college, but they're not an HBCU. They are a PBI. Uh, and so uh, it is certainly, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a shame that, again, this ransomware attack um, uh, impacted. Um, uh, this school, but this is what the New York Times says. Last year, 1,043 schools in the United States were the victims of ransomware attacks, according to an analysis by MSASOV. Of those, 26 were colleges or universities. Howard University was also impacted uh, by uh, a, a, 
data attack as well. And so uh, we've seen a significant number of programs race uh, to lock up their data as a result uh, of this. But it, it, it's, it's always uh, a shame, um, again, when uh, you lose an opportunity uh, in a rural part of the country, uh, in rural Illinois, uh, Mustafa, uh, for students uh, not being able to go to college. Every time we lose one of our institutions, we lose a tiny bit of our culture and our history. You know, to have an institution that's been around for that long to be lost, um, you know, it, it's just a shame. And then the other part of it is folks got to better understand cold storage and keeping our information there so it's not accessible uh, by so many folks, um, whether it's on the ransomware side or other ways that they're trying to get that information and, and then hold us hostage. And of course, the last part of it is that We've got to better, um, you know, fund our institutions because we don't have the endowments to be able to bounce back when those things happen. So, you know, we've got a lot of work to do to protect those institutions of ours that still exist. Uh, and uh, again, as people now begin to realize uh, that, uh, you know what, we're now living in a in, in the world of technology. You've got to be able to protect your data and your assets, Teresa, uh, and that means that's gonna require a significant investment. And I'm gonna tell you, Howard University experienced it. They had a hard time trying to come back from that, uh, from, from that ransomware attack. You're absolutely right. And you know, um, Congress and the Senate has bills just sitting there waiting for them to review um, so we can um, talk about cybersecurity and also the protection. Look, black and brown people are going to these institutions. They're getting educated. We're giving them the data that they ask for, right? So we're giving them name, contact information, credit card information, sometimes social security numbers if we're getting a loan. And this is all taken in, um, you know, we call it the bursar, but at the registry register office when you are signing up for a new educational institution. So we are hoping that, you know, since we're paying thousands of dollars to go to this institution, that they have the right system to protect their students. So if they're not willing to protect their students, institutions and organizations alike, then you should not be asking for our college tuition. And here's what's uh, what's so unfortunate, uh, Demario. This is from uh, Lincoln Lincoln College's page. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's namesake college set to close after 157 years. Uh, it is going to close effective uh, May 13th. That is in three days. But this is what is even more sad. It said the institution experienced record-breaking student enrollment in the fall of 2019 with residence halls at maximum capacity. But then COVID hit. COVID hit, then the ransomware attack hit in December of 21, and the, as a result, there was no way that they could survive. You know, I'm going to be a little bit on the outline, uh, maybe a little contradictory here. I mean, all institutions do not have to continue to survive forever. As you said, the road and things are changing, and so I don't know much about this university outside of the story that you sent over to us. Certainly don't want anyone to not to lose. I want anyone to lose out on educational opportunities. But consolidating uh, smaller schools into larger schools they may not be such a bad thing, particularly when it comes to resources in our community. You know, we see this again a lot. Like, like I say here in Oklahoma, for sure. Like with churches, you know, we have a church, three or four churches on every corner. You know, and is that is, is that really the best way to utilize our resources, or should it be more consolidation? Where it can be more uh, collective power, collective opportunities to have the type of uh, security and resources that Teresa talked about. So you can provide your students with not only a good educational environment, but also to secure their, their data. So, you know, obviously, again, I don't want to see anyone lose educational opportunities, but it may not be the best, worst thing for an institution to consolidate. All right, folks, uh, hold tight one second. We come back, our black and missing also. Uh, how vital are COVID vaccine boosters? We are seeing uh, an increase with the new variants that can't protect you. If you've already been vaccinated, we'll talk with the doctor about that. Plus, in our marketplace segment, we'll talk about a black owned eyewear company. All that next, right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, you're going to learn about the silver tsunami, which means that a million people are turning 65 every day and they're going to need some kind of care. You're going to meet two sisters 
whose situation with their own family led them to start a business in this industry and now they're showing others. This is our passion, our mission, our purpose, our ministry. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Y'all know who Roland Martin is. He got the ask God only do the news. It's fancy news. Keep it rolling right here. Rolling. Rolling Martin. <laughs> right now. You are watching Roland Martin, unfiltered. I mean, could it be any other way? Really? It's Roland Martin. Seventeen-year-old Maya Manuel disappeared from Lancaster, California, on November 28, 2021. She's five feet three inches tall, weighs 140 pounds, with brown hair and brown eyes. Anyone with information on Maya Manuel should call the LA County Sheriff's Office at 661-948-8466. 661-948-8466. Folks, uh, experts say we should see up to 100 million more people getting COVID-19 this fall and winter. Today, the U.S. has 83 million reported coronavirus cases and over 1 million deaths since the pandemic started. A new study finds the fourth dose of Moderna or Pfizer already authorized in the U.S. for people 50 and older is safe and provides for a substantial boost to immunity at similar or even better levels than a third dose. So, what is going on? Where are we with our uh, doses? Dr. Alexa Gaffney, an infectious disease specialist, joins me uh, to answer uh, that question. Doc, glad to have you here. First and foremost, uh, before we get to the fourth shot, let's deal with the third. Uh, where are we right now on the rates of people getting that third booster? I just got my third booster yesterday. Um, I had to delay that because I got the antibody. After getting COVID in December, I got the antibodies, and so I had to wait a period of time to actually get the, the, the booster shot. Yeah. So, unfortunately, we're not in a position where we are really changing people's minds. Um, whereas in the second surge of the pandemic, we saw a lot of people who weren't initially vaccinated rushing out to get the COVID-19 vaccines. We're not seeing that kind of increase in rates of vaccination. So we really haven't moved the number in terms of the percentage of eligible children and adults in the United States, you know, rushing out to get vaccinated. Is that because there was so much attention on the initial vaccine uh, that then people said, okay, fine, I got it, I'm good, not realizing that that, um, that, that dissipates, it begins to wane? Yeah, there's a, I think there's a mixture of um, issues or concerns. Some people are saying, you know, they told me it would be one dose, then it was two, now they're talking about a third, I'm just not getting a booster. And so the folks who didn't go out and get a, a third dose are certainly not interested in, in getting a fourth dose or getting a booster. Um, there's been a, a really a failure to communicate effectively about the difference between getting a booster for some folks and some people uh, those of us who are moderate to severely immunocompromised, those of us who are very early, that third dose was not really a booster for those individuals. That third dose was the completion of the primary series, and now the fourth dose is um, being considered the same, a, a completion of a primary series for the people who are at really high risk, and it's a booster for those who are at average risk to have complications or ho for hospitalization from COVID-19 infection. So, so, mm -hmm. so one of the things that's interesting, again, we're seeing, like right now, I'm uh, sitting here, I'm going through um, uh, some um, uh, tweets here in just about 25 minutes ago. Go to my, come on, guys, switch. Uh, Bill Gates, co-founder of Microsoft, uh, announced Tuesday he had tested positive for COVID-19, experiencing mild symptoms, said he will isolate until he is again healthy. Uh, then we also have um, 
uh, let's see here, um, uh, P Professor Peter Hotez. We've had him on the show uh, down with uh, Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. He said that he tested positive, moderate symptoms of fatigue, headache, sore throat, isolating at home, doing Zoom meetings. Um, he says, I'm grateful to have been vaccinated, boosted, which certainly prevented more severe illness. Just started uh, Paxlovid transmission up. Be careful. We have this, this new variant out uh, that is even more infectious. Can you explain to people um, how so? What is that? Um, so the new variant, which is called BA.2, is considered a sub-variant of the Omicron uh, variant or mutated form of the COVID-19 virus. And viruses are smart. They want to live, they want to spread and propagate themselves. So the virus mutates in such a way that changes its behavior or changes its impact on people. So we're seeing even more transmission of these newer variants of the virus. So you can spend less face-to-face -face time with a person and still become infected and people are becoming symptomatic in shorter time frames than we saw with the original wild strains mm -hmm. uh, of the virus. And so um, we're seeing increased transmission and to some degree we're seeing milder illness, but some of that is because we're seeing the illness in people who are vaccinated and or boosted. Um, we're seeing some milder illness because people may have previously been infected and we're seeing some milder illness just because the virus itself has changed. However, that does not mean that COVID-19 is behaving like a common cold. It does not mean that people are not at risk to get um, complications like the pneumonia, the blood clots, the long COVID um, mm -hmm. or long haulers, you know, that we're still seeing huge and significant impacts um, with long hauler syndrome, we're learning more and more about that. And so even though some people have a milder illness, the, the hospital re hospitalization rates are, again, creeping upwards all over the country, including in areas where people are highly vaccinated. Um, and so we still have to be careful. The whole country has really pulled their mask off, including in the Northeast, where we were really, really aggressive about slowing down the spread mm -hmm. of the virus in the beginning and we've got bitten in the butt you know here in Man. new york yep go ahead here in new york you know they we were told by the mayor of new york city you know the mass mandates will be dropped and we want to open the city and we want to see our our city flourish and that's important for financial reasons but it doesn't work for public health uh, issues and public health implications. So there was an increased number of cases and our mayor had to put his tail between his legs and say, you know what, I know I promised, you know, that we would be out of these masks, but they need to go back on. But once you have told people they don't have to wear their masks, it's really hard to get them back in without any state or federal mandates. So we don't have that anymore. People have gotten accustomed to being about out and about without masks and gathering in crowds, and we are seeing the consequences of that right now. In, I mean, fact, in fact, this is an AP um, uh, story. This is another tweet uh, <coughs> they posted seven hours ago. We're becoming blind to yeah. what is happening with the virus because COVID-19 testing has plummeted globally. Yep. Yeah, unfortunate. Well, fortunately, people have access to home tests. And they are being diagnosed and they can, you know, call their primary and do a telehealth visit. But those cases are not being recorded. We, d we don't open up our Internet servers and see those COVID tickers anymore. So really, people have turned a blind eye to the fact that we are still living in a pandemic and people um, continue to die. People continue to be hospitalized and that will continue to be the case if we don't take it seriously. But I don't think that we are going to be able to reverse people's behaviors back to the earlier stages of the pandemic. And so, you know, on an individual basis, we really have to assess our actual health risk and we have to seriously assess our risk tolerance and, and really hunker down. I've never taken off my mask. I continue to wear my mask in my office in public places, outside, if there's a lot of people around, I'm just not willing to see what's going to happen if I get this virus. Now, here's what's interesting, uh, before I go to my panel uh, to ask questions. And so, 
um, I had never gotten this alert, and uh, I don't know if any of my panelists have gotten this as well, and I was in a group chat with some other people, and it was the first time this actually happened. So when I was in uh, Los Angeles, um, I was at the Maxwell concert. Uh, all of a sudden, ping on my phone, uh, and then it, it comes up. It, it came from the D.C. Health um, d Department, uh, and it said that, uh, give me one second, let me, let me do the screen share one second, because I want you all to see this. Uh, and again, this, this is the first time I'd ever seen this, uh, and I'm like, okay, did I get enrolled in something I wasn't aware of? Uh, and it came up and it said, you might have been exposed to COVID-19. The exposure notification system on your cell phone constantly scans and exchanges random tokens with the phones of people you are near to for 15 minutes or more. Uh, then it said, one of those people has tested positive for COVID-19. Based on the strength and duration of the signals between the two phones, DC Health believes it is likely you were in close contact with this person and you may have been exposed. If you're experiencing systems, recommend you self-quarantine. It goes through all the different directions there. Um, I had not seen that before. Uh, can you explain, that? first of all, can you explain how I got that notice? It, did, did we enroll in something? So explain this pinging of phones. Yeah, so they are using technology to, you know, try to help avert a public health crisis. The, the, the problem with the pandemic is by the time people realized that they were infected or by the time people became symptomatic, they had already spent two, three, four, five days engaging with other people, going to restaurants, going to wherever, um, and then they had already spread the virus to a number of people. In the beginning of the pandemic, there was this, this idea that you could use smartphone technology and you know the way our cell phones are tracked and pinged from towers to keep an eye on um, whether or not people were in proximity to other people who tested positive for COVID. But you used to be able to opt out of that. So it's not necessarily that you downloaded an app or that you're using something on your phone or that you accepted, okay, I'm going to allow my phone to be tracked and to tell me if I'm in proximity to people uh, who tested positive for COVID, it's happening. And it's kind of like the smart technology that when you start talking about something or searching for something, every time you browse, now you're getting an advertisement for that thing you showed interest in, right? It's the same thing. Um, this person who owns this phone tested positive for COVID-19 and their phone was next to Roland's phone. It was next to... Don and that, that, that means phone. somebody tested positive, was entered into a system, and they still traveled. Yeah. Well, there's no mandates, right? There's, unless you leave the country, there's no rule that says you can't get on an airplane, a bus, a train, etc. We're working on the honor system, but we're you know, not a very honorable country these days, so. Um, any questions from our panelists? I have a question. Go. So, um, one, thank you so much for the information. Um, you know, it's, it's been tough. Like, I'm here in the, the city of Philadelphia, and, you know, kind of to your point about, uh, you know, telling people to get masks and then turnover, you know, three days later, you don't have to wear a mask anymore. It's really trying. Um, I guess, like, maybe what is your recommendation, you know, so outside of just wearing a mask, you know, because now we're told that we may need another booster, do you recommend that people still stay on the every six-month regimen to get a booster shot? Or do we, do we just mask up and see what happens? So, um... There's very hard data and there's a very strong recommendation for people who are considered moderate, moderately to severely immunocompromised to definitely get that fourth dose. So that's our very elderly. That's people with conditions like cancer who may have chemotherapy treatments or radiation therapies, um, people who were born with immunocompromised um, states, and those people know who they are, people with HIV or AIDS that's not well controlled, their immune system is suppressed, people who have autoimmune diseases, they take 
you know, more than 10, 10 milligrams of prednisone or steroids on a daily basis or other medicines that chronically suppress their immune system, those people absolutely should get a fourth dose. Um, and there's a very set schedule depending upon if you started with Pfizer, Moderna, or a Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And those four doses actually pan out to occur over a roughly four-month uh, period, depending on when you started your vaccine series. We don't all necessarily need to go out and get a fourth dose, but for those people who are at high risk to be hospitalized from COVID or high risk to die from COVID-19 infection should definitely um, get the fourth dose, and then it can be on a case-by-case -case basis. There's no checks when you go to present for a booster. You know, they're really going to just be looking at your vaccine card, but there's no documentation in the system that says Dr. Alexia is moderate to severe immunocompromised and, and Roland isn't. Um, they're relying on people's self-report or and if you're uncertain, really definitely talk to your doctor about that. The other thing to take into consideration would be, you know, what is the likelihood that you are going to get exposed to COVID? Are you someone who is able to work from home or are you taking public transportation to a office space that may be filled with people with different vaccine status, different mask wearing behaviors and different um, levels of tolerance, right? If I keep my mask on all day, every day, and I'm vaccinated, it, it doesn't matter if the person sitting at the desk next to me is, you know, hanging out with 50 people every time they leave the office, you know, that still poses some risk of exposure. You know, the thing we have to remember is that our vaccines are just that. Their vaccines. They help us avoid severe illness. They help us stay out of the hospital. They help us not die and they prevent long COVID, but they do not prevent other people who are infected with COVID from breathing that virus on us. Um, and it doesn't prevent us from getting an infection and potentially having symptoms. So it's not perfect, but it's absolutely better protection than doing nothing at all. And I don't recommend that anybody allow themselves to be a, a sitting duck because long COVID is real and people are having really severe uh, symptoms and that syndrome affects literally every organ system in the body and we have no definitive treatment or cure for long COVID. So beyond the, the initial, you know, flu-like illness or, you know, severe COVID-19 illness, however you experience it, still there's a significant proportion of people who will get long COVID without a vaccine protection. Um, um, any other question, Demario or Mustafa? Now, I don't yeah. have a question. I just want to say the doctor is so clear and concise. I appreciate what you're doing and explaining this to us. I have been thinking about, do I have to get another shot? Do you don't want to take another shot? So you really uh, cleared up some things in my mind, doc. I sure appreciate you. Absolutely, my pleasure. Doc, I, I've had five friends in the last two weeks who have gotten uh, infected um, with COVID. A couple of them, 32, 33 years old, and actually bedridden. Um, the question is, one of them said the reason that they hadn't moved forward with getting boosted um, was they heard that they now had to bear the cost uh, of that. Could you clear up for folks, is there a cost associated with either of the vaccines or the boosters? No, there's no cost at all to get vaccinated for COVID-19. Um, in fact, Doc, in fact, I just, I, I just let, Doc, I just let people know, like yesterday, I literally went to a grocery store, uh, filled the form out. I was asked, do you have insurance or not? They only asked for the insurance for reporting purposes. It didn't cost me anything to get the booster. Right. Yeah, there's no cost associated with getting a COVID-19 vaccine, and that's regardless of where you go get it, whether you get it at your local pharmacy, grocery store, um, whether you get it at your local Department of Health. I was about to name some big box stores, but, you know, I don't want to do that. Um, but regardless of where you get your COVID-19 vaccine, it should not come at any out-of-pocket cost to you. Um, and, um, and again, I just want people to understand uh, all you have to do is, so if you do this here, um, let me pull it up. So if you, if you send a text, I'm just going to go ahead and do it so I can show y'all. 
uh, let's see, 438. So if you send a text message to 438-829, um, you should, and then you put in, uh, let's see here. Um, I'm putting our zip code here. <clears throat> so if you put in your, if you send a text to 438-829 and you put in your, so again, y'all come on, come on, show it now. What y'all doing? So here's a perfect example. I sent a text message to 438-829. I put in my zip code and they immediately gave me um, uh, free sites near me where you can actually get the vaccine. And so it actually lists uh, two CVS pharmacies near uh, where our offices are. And so if you're watching, all you have to do uh, to find out where you can get a free COVID vaccine, you literally send a text message to 438-829, 438-829. And they also still are doing free testing. So because uh, I am traveling, I, I just got back from Los Angeles. I was in Miami. I was in LA for six days. I was in Miami for the uh, F1 Miami Grand, uh, Grand Prix. Uh, I'm traveling to Kansas City on Thursday for a town hall. Then we have a town hall in Cedar Hill in uh, Dallas next week. Uh, so I've already, I went online today and I found, okay, who's still doing free COVID testing? Uh, I got to do a PCR test tomorrow uh, just to make sure that, again, with all the traveling, all the things that I've been going on. Um, and, and like, perfect example, like, I, I'm, I'm allergic to smoke. Uh, and so I, was, I, I came into contact with a lot of smoke when I was in Miami. Uh, and so when that gets in my system, screws me up, but want to be make sure that it's not COVID. Uh, exactly. And what is it? So I said, fine, we get the PCR test. So you still can just go online and literally type in free COVID testing and put in your zip code and it'll come up. Yep. There's so many resources um, and they're all by and large free. And the reason for that is because this is a public health issue. Um, you may do just fine with your COVID-19 infection, but the person sitting at the bar next to you on the bus, the train, at the you know birthday party, wedding, engagement party, baby shower, whatever, may become critically ill from that infection. So, you know, we don't want to be responsible for getting somebody else sick. But we also, more importantly than that, want to take care of ourselves. And we need to know our COVID status, just like we need to know our HIV yep. status, right? Um, in, in the short term, COVID has some really huge implications, as well as in the long term. And so it's important to know, you know, the masking behavior of the folks who you are visiting with, the people who you're socializing with. It's important to know what they're up to. Right. Did they travel? Were they in a large crowd? Did they have symptoms? Did they test and make sure they don't have COVID? How did they test? Did they use a home test? Did they go get a PCR? What was the timing of the test? There's so much important things that we need to know and understand. But the, the most important thing to know and understand is that COVID is still with us. We're still in a pandemic. Um, we definitely need to consider getting vaccinated and figure out whether or not you are someone who is at high risk. And if you qualify for a booster, please do go get it. You know, a pain in the arm or a day of feeling achy or crummy or having fevers is a very small price to pay to prevent a critical illness, to prevent a death, to prevent chronic lung disease and to prevent long COVID, which is a very, very serious outcome that has no specific intervention and no cure. All right, then. Dr. Gaffney, we sure appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Thanks for having me on. All right, folks, we come back. Our Marketplace segment, Black Eyewear Company. Uh, you definitely want to hear about. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Next on A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie. Summertime when the living is easy, or is it? Summer vacations, class reunions, kids in summer camp, all fun, but stressful. You need to get into a summer mindset and have a plan. Oh yes, our panel gives us their favorite summer planning hacks. On a next A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie here at Black Star Network. A powerful movement is rising across America. From the Mississippi Delta to the Apache Stronghold. 
from the homeless encampments of Washington State to the coal fields of Appalachia of West Virginia. We are the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, and we are building the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. On June 18th, ahead of this year's midterm elections, while the Congress is still in session, we will hold a mass poor people's and low wage workers assembly and moral march on Washington to arrest the attention of the nation, to put a face and a voice on poverty and low wages in this country. This is a watershed moment for justice and democracy in America. There are those who say that transformative change is impossible, but history teaches us that it is precisely in times like these that people must build a broad and deep movement from the bottom up. We must compel this nation to repent, to lament, and to see the realities that have been hidden for far too long. On June 18th, we will come together to lift the voices of the poor and low-wage workers who know that change is not only possible, it is essential for our survival. We will make the connections to show how systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism and white supremacy are hurting us all. We will show the nation the faces of Americans who cannot afford to go back to normal. We will detail the policies that can move us toward a society that works for everyone. And we will pledge to go home and build power for transformative change in this year's election and for years to come. Because the question should have never been, how much will it cost to address poverty? The real question is, how much is it costing us not to? Somebody's been hurting our people. It's gone on far too long and we won't be silent or unseen anymore. Join us in D.C. on June 18th. Build with us for a third reconstruction in America. Visit poorpeoplescampaign.org. Peace and love, everybody. I'm Purple Wonder Love. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> Two successful black businesses are joining forces to help build and generate wealth in our community. Uh, Greenwood's largest black-owned digital banking company just bought The Gathering Spot, an exclusive members-only club for black leaders and creatives. This acquisition creates the largest combined financial tech and community platform for uh, African Americans. Co-founders of The Gathering Spot, Ryan Wilson and T.K. Peterson, will still be at the helm as chief community officer of Greenwood and vice president of the digital banking platform. And so terms were not released, but certainly congratulations. It's good to see black folks making other black folks millionaires. All right, folks, this next segment is perfect for my staff because all of them are blind as hell. They all wear glasses. Have you ever been to the eye doctor or packing for a vacation and couldn't find any frames you liked? Well, a Vontel Eyewear boasts unique frames with African-inspired themes and colors. The company recently linked a deal with Nickelodeon to create a children's eyewear line. Co-founders Nancy Harris and Tracy Green join us from Brooklyn, New York. Glad to have both of you here. Okay, so first of all, uh, whose idea was to start this unique line? I would say it was me. I lost a pair of expensive glasses and just were tired of all the glasses looking the same and not really fitting well. And I called my best friend, Nancy. Uh, we met in Morgan State University and she lost See a pair of glasses too. Say it again. I said, and she lost a pair of glasses too. We were both frustrated and we wanted something different. Nancy, you, 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 you made a comment there, go ahead. Oh, I just said HBCUs in the house. Okay, gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. So, uh, so you, so you, the impetus was losing an expensive pair of glasses. That's how it started. Okay, and you started how long ago? It's three years now. And uh, I started the concept in 2019. And Nancy, how has it grown? 
Well, it's been growing leaps and bounds. Um, we are getting a lot of attention, but one of the greatest things that we have done most recently is that, like you said, we inked a deal in July of 2021. Vontel was awarded a licensing deal with Viacom CBS to produce children's eyewear, and we are the first women of color to acquire this deal. So these glasses will be inspired by Nickelodeon characters, so we're going to be able to expand our line from the adults um, of having the African prints to having the cartoon characters, et cetera, such as Baby Shark, um, Paw Patrol, Rugrats, and SpongeBob. Um, and, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, people wear glasses. Uh, and so did y'all say, you know what, um, let's, let's get rid of the boring look. Let's, let's, let's make it a little funky. Definitely. Absolutely. We wanted pattern. We wanted design. We wanted something that was not was not in the in the market. We wanted to see our culture, and you know, you walk into any eyeglass place, they all look the same. And we started with fabrics, and because we launched in the pandemic, we made masks to match. So we were like, hey, you know, everyone's on virtual meetings, and it was actually the right time because everybody needed blue light blocker lenses because of all the computers that they were on. So we were able to, you know, sell um, people. All you see is your face when you're in a virtual meeting, and people wanted to show their personality, and our glasses do that. Who designs them? Nancy and I. We do. Okay. All right, cool. Questions from my panelists. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Mustafa, uh, you first. I have to ask, um, what's your top-selling glasses right now, or the frames right now? For the, For the women... women it's the pair of glasses that I'm wearing right now. They're called Rwanda Wayfarers, and um, they're selling out really fast. We actually have to put in a new order for these particular pair of glasses. And for the men, it's the Akasha Aviators. Um, they look really good on the men. They are tortoise shell. They're really rich and um, also inspired by the heritage. And then these rands as well, the black rands, those are selling out. I think we have three left. <laughs> <laughs> these these we have one now. They have like three left. These are the Akasha aviators that the men and the women buy. They look beautiful. All right. Yeah, but we we made them with men in mind. But you know, women always have to cross that line. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa. Well, congratulations, ladies. Um, I was very excited to read about your story. Um, and um, the first thing I thought of was, okay, great, we got Nickelodeon. Let's go get Marvel. So, um, I can't, yeah, I know that's the next market. So, um, please, uh, keep us posted when that happens. Oh, yeah. No, we have a couple of things in mind that we want to do. Of course, going after Marvel and a couple of other deals that we want to ink. But one of the other projects that we just did and we're really excited about is, uh, we we just did a partnership with Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated for their uh, centennial anniversary. And we have glasses that we have made and designed specifically for them, but anyone can wear them because we did not put the insignia on the glasses. But if you love the colors, gold and royal blue, these are the glasses for you. So these are going hot, and there's only a limited edition of these glasses right here, but we're really excited. And down the line, our goal is to get the entire divine line. I am a Delta. Um, I represent Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated, so it would be great for us to represent all. Um, and we are giving back a portion of all proceeds to the sorority so that they can give back to their scholarship fund. Awesome. All right, then. So uh, that is uh, great. Uh, how many units are y'all moving uh, every year? So we have, we're moving a lot of units, actually. Um, we've done really well this year. We started in the pandemic, and for the first six months, we moved maybe a couple hundred, and now we're moving thousands. Um, we had to pivot. Originally, we were only selling, we wanted to sell online only, and we realized that people need to touch and feel the glasses. So we pivoted, and we are in 30 stores uh, across the country, and we just started selling to Dominica, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica. So we are expanding every day. The more people get to know us, they love it. They love the idea. They love the fit. No one has a line across their nose anymore. The temples are longer, so it's more comfortable behind your ears. If you ever had a headache wearing glasses, it's because 
the temples are too short and they're on your pressure points. And people with bigger cheekbones, nice fit for over your cheekbones so it doesn't put a line here as, as either, either, so you don't have indentation. So we are finding people are loving the fit and how comfortable they feel, and we're, we're selling out. We're moving units all across the country. All right, then. Yeah. That, that is uh, absolutely great. Uh, give the uh, website where people can actually can check it out. www.vontelle.com. -E -E and we're on all social media, Vontel Eyewear, Vontel, Vontel LLC, Vontel, www.vontel.com. All right, then. We certainly appreciate uh, both of you. Thank you so very much for joining us. And we got a pair of glasses for Thank you, Thank you for Don't having worry. us. Uh, so, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. Say it again. I said, we got a pair of glasses for you, Roland. Don't worry. No need. I can see. <laughs> sunglasses to block you, the sun. Uh, well, sun, sunglasses, fine. But uh, in terms of other glasses, I'm good. Now, you, now my brother and my three sisters, they all blind. Uh, but you can hook them up. So uh, it works out. All right, folks. Uh, thanks a bunch. And of course, the uh, way I roll, I'm an alpha. So they got to be black and gold. All right. I appreciate it. Sure. Of course. All right. We got you. We got you. All right. Thank you so very much. Uh, all right, folks. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the uh, final story I'm going to go with today. Uh, South Carolina state offices were closed today for Confederate Memorial Day. South Carolina gubernatorial candidate Joe Cunningham shared this tweet about the, quote, state holiday. Today, state offices are closed to observe Confederate Memorial Day. This is another example of how our state continues to live in the past. Honestly, it's embarrassing when I'm governor, we're going to end Confederate Memorial Day and make Election Day a state holiday instead. Uh, of course, South Carolina is one of many states pushing to enact uh, critical race theory bills. State offices in Alabama and Mississippi closed last month to observe Confederate Memorial Day. And of course, uh, it's Republicans who stand uh, ready to salute Confederate Memorial Day. Just want to let y'all know who y'all dealing with. All right, Teresa, Mustafa, Demario, I really appreciate y'all being on the panel today. Thank you so very much. Uh, folks, uh, don't forget, tomorrow, uh, Thursday, we're going to be in Kansas City uh, for a citywide town hall focused on uh, police abuse there, really a treatment of black police. Uh, again, it's gonna be taking place in Kansas City. Again, Thursday, Thursday, May 12th, uh, is gonna be taking place 5 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Central, uh, taking place there uh, in Kansas City, in Kansas City. Uh, and so we're partnering with the Kansas City Urban League. Uh, folk, all folks are invited to come out uh, because, again, police officers have been talk, dealing with racism in their department for quite some time. And so uh, we're gonna be there uh, dealing with that. And so looking forward to that. Uh, racism in the Kansas City Police Department addressing the black and blue divide. Also, you two, why are you taking so long? Okay, leave the graphic up. Y'all should be should at a thousand likes by now. D don't make sense y'all keep having me asking for a thousand likes. Uh, so just hit the like button, okay? It ain't that hard. Hit the like button real quick so we can get out of here. Hit a thousand likes uh, before we go, okay? So just hit the doggone button, okay? We're at 928, don't take long. Again, Thursday. 5 p.m., 6 p.m. Eastern, Robert J. Mohart Center, 3200 Wayne Avenue, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, so looking forward uh, to being there and having that conversation. Uh, and again, you know, our desire is very simple. That is to get African Americans uh, to unite uh, behind these issues, uh, because again, uh, these police officers, these I mean, we, we we profile the story how these black officers in Kansas City are dealing with vast racism in that department, and folks there really don't give a damn. And so uh, we certainly want to stand with them uh, as they are uh, fighting all the uh, fighting as best that they can uh, to improve their lot uh, there in the police department. So we're looking forward to having all the folks come out uh, for that uh, citywide town hall uh, thank you so very much and finally youtube we hit a thousand likes we should do that in the first hour y'all just hit the like button it ain't that hard all right that's it i'll see you guys tomorrow right here on roland martin unfiltered don't forget download our black star network app available on all platforms apple phone android phone apple tv android tv roku amazon fire tv xbox one samsung smart tv also uh, you can uh please contribute to our bring the funk fan club your dollars make it possible for us to travel to places like Kansas City, for us to be able to uh, travel next week uh, to Texas. Uh, that's critically important. So you can send a check or money order, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 0196. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Uh, uh, Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingatsmartin.com. Uh, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. So that's it, folks. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Ho!